Well, it is a blessing to see each and every one of you here as we get ready um, to continue in the midst of our assembly. You know that it has been our practice for recent years that we do not take down the worship wear in the midst of assembly, and there's a reason for that. It's really important that what we do in the midst of our time together, there is there's not uh, a separation between our worship time and every el everything else that we do. As people of God, we don't compartmentalize our lives. All of life is God's. This worship wear and the baptismal font is a physical reminder in your presence that all of life begins, belongs to God, and that all we do, we do in God's name. We're at a point in this assembly where um, I like to help us think about setting the theme. What are we doing? And to do that, I want to tell you a story that my guess is you all know. It's the story of a traveler who once upon a time came to a small village, and as he entered the village, he had absolutely nothing except a small sack on his back. He had no food. And he began going door to door in the community, knocking and seeing if he could get a bit of something to eat from someone. And the answer again and again and again was, no, I don't have that. No, I don't have extra. No, not at all. So what he did, create a fellow that he was, in the middle of the town square, he got a big pot, he started a fire, put water in it, and as it began to boil, he would dip a spoon in it and he would sip it, and then people began coming by and went, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm making a big feast. Really? What is it? He's well, it's a small It's a little weak right now. Might you have a potato? Well, I do. And the person went home and got a potato. Another person happened by. I mean, imagine it. It looked a little strange. This guy, no one knew. Someone else came up and said, what is it? He said, well, it's new. He tasted it again. He said, it's a little weak. Got a good potato flavor going right now, but might you have some carrots? And the person said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And went home and got some. Well, this continued for a while as people came and go, went, and he invited them to bring back onions and turnips, spices, meat. And pretty soon there was a huge cauldron and an entire community came out and they ate together. That's the vision of abundance that I hope that you are able to encounter in the midst of this assembly. Sometimes we want to sit behind our closed doors and think that we only have just enough, just a little bit, not much more than enough, and we have to keep it to ourselves when in reality, if we gather it all together, we end up with an incredible abundance and there is enough for everyone to eat. So the abundance that we want you to think about is not just the abundance of money. We are going to engage that, and I'm not embarrassed to tell you that, but I want you to see the other abundance that we're lifting up as well. Go look by the poolside and look at the art display because there is an abundance of talented people within our Lutheran churches in the Western North Dakota Synod. And this was just a tip of the iceberg group of people who were willing to come put something out and show it to you. I invite you to walk down the Congregational Ministry Fair and take a look at all of the incredible ministries creative things that different congregations of this synod are doing. People who have recognized the abundance in their midst and looking for different creative ways to share God's grace and mercy. You see the musical instruments up here? There are going to be several times during this assembly that you are going to be invited to engage with some different creative music. Because we have incredibly gifted people in this synod with gifts to share. And we wanted to lift some of them up. It would be great to be able to invite a group from every congregation in this synod to come and do that. Unfortunately, we can't. But you get a taste of that. 
Look for the abundance all around you and begin to pray and wonder what God might do with all of this abundance. So as we were thinking about um, gathering around living in God's abundance, we had the idea that what would it look like if we invited a few people from our synod to get up and think along some different ways when it comes to abundance. And we've had the gift of getting to know some new people in our synod. Does anyone have new people in their communities? So Teresa Howey is from Belfield Lutheran, and Teresa um, is not native to North Dakota. Her husband is, he's a documentary filmmaker. He came back to do a documentary on um, a group of people, and as he came back to the Belfield area, his love for this place was ignited again, and he and Teresa moved here. And we are blessed to invite Teresa to come up and spend some time talking with us um, through the eyes of a newcomer to this place. What is the abundance that she sees? Will you welcome Teresa Howard? Hello. Bishop Mark. I could listen to him all day long. He's amazing. I thank you so much for having me today. It is truly an honor to be asked to speak. I was telling my friends uh, Judy and Jean, you know, I can sing in front of thousands of people all day long and not get a bit nervous about it, but speaking is a whole different thing, so I hope that you'll bear with me. A Bible verse came to me uh, immediately as I was asked to uh, present the abundance that I see as a newcomer to the area. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As Bishop Mark said, um, my husband Ken and I are, well, he's newly returned. I am completely new to the area. Um, but it's been three years already that we've been here. Three years ago, my husband Ken and I enjoyed a humble but very comfortable existence in sunny, warm, and windless Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Ken and I had a successful photography business working with advertising clients at a national level. And I was the director of worship and technology at a growing contemporary church, thriving and having a blast in what had become, after some years of hard work and prayer, a well-oiled machine of ministry and music and media. We enjoyed our church family immensely and absolutely loved spending our days with them doing God's work. Our teenage boys were mostly stable in school and happy in their home life and friendships. Life was great. We were in a reliable, comfortable, and rhythmic routine. God was moving in our home and changing lives through our ministry. And yet, Ken and I began to feel that God had some greater plan for our lives. We each felt like God was preparing us for something else. We had Never imagined how quickly the change would happen, though, or that God would lead us to Belfield, North Dakota. Even Ken didn't really think about that, you know. He, he talked about Belfield all the time, and he told me great stories of his childhood and amazing people. And I wanted to meet every one of them. I wanted him to bring me here. Show me, show me where you went to school. Show me where you played. Show me how you rode your motorcycle in uranium pits and all of these things, and why you're still alive. And so, um, but, and, you know... I remember I told Beth at the Life Keys retreat, I always wanted to be Lydia and John, but that was only part of my part of my growing up. I, I wanted to be Laura Ingalls. And I'm not even kidding, you know, I'm not making fun of North Dakota when I say that at all. I wanted her life. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to live on the prairie. I just thought that was amazing. So I always wanted to see North Dakota. Well, Ken made a solo trip up here in uh, the spring of 2013. He had started work on a documentary about the Ukrainian homesteaders in North Dakota. He made a few trips back and forth between Belfield and Phoenix, and it didn't take long for me to see that going home to North Dakota had been a great thing for Ken's mind and spirit. I finally got to visit North Dakota myself that summer and watched uh, Ken working fully in his element without thinking or having any clue of the severity and length of the North Dakota winter. I said, <laughs> maybe we should move there. Then I took it back. <laughs> 
but it was out there, and I knew that it was God. Um, I, like I said, I, you know, Ken was, he was the best version of himself when he was here, and, and what good wife wouldn't want that for her husband, right? So in the days of follow, I quickly began to take an inventory of all the perfect things in our life that would change. What had I done? Our church, our kids' lives, our comfy home, the weather, the amazing worship ministry. Wow. I was going to give up a lot. God, I thought maybe it was time for me to step out of ministry. Maybe I was done. We had people in place back in Phoenix who would take the worship and technology to new heights. Better to leave things when they're in a good place, right? Not only that. I was aware of the differences in our worship style, as far as you know, what I was used to there compared to what I saw here. And you know, not, one, not that one was any better than the other, they were just very, very different. So I believe that my time in ministry was done. Fast forward to our kitchen table in North Dakota a few months after our arrival. One Sunday afternoon, a knock on the door turned into a two hour visit with the infamous Pastor Roger Dieterle. <laughs> Ken's family had attended Belford Lufen all of his life. He was confirmed there, but had left the area before the arrival of Pastor Roger. So they had a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on. Pastor and Roger Ken filled in the details of the years between Ken going off to college and our decision to move home. We talked about our ministry in Arizona and my role as a contemporary worship leader, and Pastor's eyes lit up. We felt a quickening in the heart as Pastor Roger shared with us the prayers of the people of Belfield Lutheran Church. They had been praying for nearly three years that God would send someone to help them with their vision to offer alternative worship services. Just like that, we knew why we'd been called. And I was out of early ministry retirement. <laughs> Praise God. But we had a problem. We had nothing with which to start. We'd sold everything. We had all the live band equipment. We, you know, I had it all. And we're like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. So we sold it all and didn't bring a thing. So we, we started with nothing. Um, Bishop Mark, when he was talking about the loaves and the fishes, I started thinking, Belfield Lutheran was the five loaves, and Ken and I were the fish. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, there's, there's more to the story, and I'm happy to share the abundance of God things that took place between our arrival in North Dakota and the launch of Belfield's very first, very successful, very blessed and transformational alternative contemporary worship service attended by a representation of at least seven different denominations that we counted the very first time we got together, all worshiping in a new way, honoring our God as a unified family in extravagant praise and worship through music, prayer, and communion. If you want to know more about that, I'll be around through lunch, so um, hunt me down, or, um, you know, I, I'd love to share more about that. So I've been asked to share the abundance, as I, the abundance that I see today as an outsider. In the process of observing my new community and integrating my ministry experience with the vision of the local church and its leaders, I've seen much. I have been quite blessed by what I see. So I hope you enjoy these uh, seven or eight points of things that I have noticed um, coming from a big, big city where there's a church on every corner and there's a praise and worship rock band on every corner. Um, what I've seen up here in the smaller towns. An abundance of vision is number one. A hundred plus years ago, the pioneers in Western North Dakota had few resources but lots of vision. Today we have many resources, but do we still have that pioneering spirit? Do we still feel called to do radical things to reach God's people and share His love? As I walked through the exhibits yesterday, I was thrilled to see evidence of that abundant spirit, that pioneering spirit. In the case of Belleville Lutheran Church, the vision to offer alternative worship as a community outreach remained strong for three years, while God provided an abundance of resources and readied the people who would come and help launch that vision. God answered the prayers of the church by sending those with gifts and experience to fulfill the vision to which the people of the church had remained so faithful. As a matter of fact, only three people, just kind of a side note, only three people in our band of six are actually from Belfield Lutheran Church, and two of them aren't from Belfield at all, so I think that is just kind of a neat example of God handpicking the people that he wanted to be a part of this ministry, that Belfield Lutheran is that, that base, but it's a community outreach, it's, it's for everyone. Number two, I see an abundance of young people demonstrating their desire to be an active, visible part of the church and to do important work in ministry. Number three, I am thrilled to see an abundance of men still holding their place as the head of the household and in leadership roles of the church. There's not a lot of that that you see, um, by and large, in Phoenix. It's 
It's the women and children come faithfully, uh, but not as many of the men. And here I've seen just contain, you know, fully contained families coming together. And uh, I don't think we should take that for granted. I hold this in high regard. The number of men I have seen holding families and churches together in Phoenix is small, as I said. God forbid that the big city shift come to our communities, where men are a much less visible and dominant presence in homes and churches. May the men continue to teach the values of faith and family to their children and grandchildren far into the future. I believe our churches and ministries depend on it, and I believe that Western North Dakota sets a really good example of that. Number four, I see an abundance of mature and faithful givers. I would venture it safe to say that you have wondered what might happen to your church or ministry when so many of these longtime givers have gone to their eternal reward. Are the principles of giving back to God that which is already His being passed to the upcoming ministry leaders and to the youth that will one day carry the church forward? Are we equipping them with the mission and vision of our churches and ministries? Are they taking hold with excitement to what God has done in the past and will do in the future? It will be in their hands. The days where the vast majority of families in the community practice faithful church attendance and giving may come to an end. In many places around the nation, I feel it already has. We may have grown up in a church of sustaining givers where church finances were of little concern. But the church that has always been there has no guarantee that it always will be. The churches I have seen in western North Dakota, acknowledging I've only witnessed a sampling, seem to experience a faithful attendance of intact families. This could provide contained stability, continued stability, for our communities here, rarely seen in places like Phoenix, where ideas about church attendance, tithes, and offerings have changed, sadly. I see an abundance of joy in giving here in North Dakota, an abundance that must not be taken for granted, it must be nurtured and spread as more people join the communities from around the country where there is no accountability for church attendance, with a church on every corner vying for their membership and their money. Number five, I see an abundance of opportunity for being Christ to the newcomers of the communities. For a number of reasons, the lost, hurting, and seeking have come to North Dakota. I'm glad to say that I didn't come for the oil. That's a question that I get asked all the time. <laughs> I'm sure you're here for the oil. No. <laughs> so, um, for whatever reason, they're here. Churches and ministries in Western North Dakota are in a unique position for outreach. Lutheran churches in general, I feel, seem to have an amazing opportunity to reach people. If you're a Catholic in Western North Dakota, the place where you go to worship is really obvious. But if you're a newcomer to the area with a non-denominational background such as I have, finding a church can be difficult. But the Lutheran Church is a great option for solid Bible-based teaching for any Protestant denomination. And I think that makes this a really unique opportunity that the Lutherans have to open their doors to people of all faiths. How exciting to think that the churches we attend in our beloved communities are placed directly in the path of those who might find God's love in us. He has given us abundance that we might share it with those in transition. It's possible that God brought them into our lives because they have gifts and experience that might further grow the ministries here in North Dakota. These strangers may have been handpicked by God to serve in your churches and add to your abundance, further spreading his word and his love. Number six, I see an abundance of willing servants. I'm inspired when I see the respect for God's house demonstrated in the care and maintenance of North Dakota's church buildings. There seems to be an understanding that the church is God's house. We are his family, expected guests. I started writing on my notes last night and it made me <laughs> go back and forth. Number seven, we have an abundance of gifts and talents. It's been mentioned already here this morning. The more people I meet in North Dakota, the more time I spend with them, the more obvious their gifts and talents become. I heard from a woman who expressed that she would love to have a nursery ministry, but didn't know whether there was a need. I met another sweet woman who desires to have a place in ministry, is very passionate about prayer, but didn't know where she could serve. I witnessed young men who are as shy as can be in one-on-one -on -one situations step up to the pulpit at the request of the pastor and lead the congregation boldly on Sunday mornings. Still other quiet folks would agree to take part in dramatic presentations and completely mesmerize us with their talent. An abundance of untapped gifts. Are we helping people find their place? One example that I wanted to share is Jean. 
She is our organist at Belfield Lutheran. And when we started talking about the contemporary worship, she's, she's actually the music director at Belfield Lutheran. And um, she was very supportive right off the bat of what we were talking about doing. She really wanted to have that rock band format for contemporary worship. I had no idea the rocker that she is. <laughs> she plays the organ so beautifully on Sunday mornings, but then on that, that one, one night a month, she gets up there and she's just a whole different person. And I think, she, I hope she's having fun. We adore her. So anyway, kind of, you know, I, as you can tell, I'm a bit of an extrovert and, um, you know, coming to a world of introverts and um, actually through Beth, I found out I'm actually an extrovert and introvert. So I am one of you. <laughs> I'm so glad. But anyway, um, so, you know, with, with examples like Jean, these different people that I mentioned that I've seen in the church, these young men and so forth, it just reminds me that God doesn't only call the equipped. He equips the called. So you might not have, or you might not think that you have all of the things that you need, but if God puts a call on your life, pursue it. He will give you the tools that you need through his abundance. <coughs> Finally, we have God's abundance. No, let me take that back. I knew I was going to get lost. No, that's right. <laughs> Finally, we have God's abundance. An abundance without limits. We have access to all of the resources, financial and otherwise, because God owns it all. An abundance of people with all their gifts and talents, wisdom and experience, to fulfill the call, call that God has placed on our ministries. We are called to do things far beyond our own power, things that can only be accomplished by the power and presence of the living God, utilizing all of the abundance that he has entrusted to us. May we always see God's abundance, May we strive to help others to move in his abundance so that the lost and broken will see Christ in us. So for a quick, a quick recap, number one, an abundance of vision. I encourage you to pray for clarity in what God would have you and your ministry do. Number two, an abundance of young people. I encourage you to guide them. Number three, an abundance of men. I encourage them, pray for them. Number four, an abundance of mature and faithful givers. Honor them by teaching new generations the importance and the blessing of obedient giving. Number five, an abundance of opportunity to be Christ to newcomers and visitors. Welcome them. Obey God's call when he nudges you to reach out to a stranger. If you feel him doing that, he really wants you to do it, and he'll give you the strength and the words to use to speak to a stranger. An abundance of willing servants is number six. Let them serve. Make room in your ministry for new leaders. Number seven, an abundance of gifts and talents. I wish life keys could be mandatory for everybody, don't you? Has it, have you all done what, life keys? Oh my goodness. Please do that when you see the opportunity. I think it tends to be leaders who will step up and do a life keys event. And a lot of you, I think if you're a leader, you kind of already know where you're supposed to serve. But the life keys, the, that is amazing. Do you even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Maybe I should be quiet. No? Maybe you could find time for Beth to tell everybody what life keys is at some point. It's amazing. And it would definitely help place people within your ministries, help them to find their place and to empower them to move forward in ministry. Number eight, God's abundance. Never ever forget that whatever God calls you to, he will provide the resources, the people, the time, and the energy to bring his plan to fruition. He owns it all, but he entrusts all of his abundance to us. We are his hands and feet. I return again to the verse, 2 Corinthians 9 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I was asked to present just a, a few challenge questions, and I don't know, um, Bishop Mark, did you want? You'll take that. Okay. Do I read them or are you just taking over? He's taking over. <laughs> Thank you so much. So each of the presenters, when they come up and, and present a piece on I Was Wondering, are leaving us with some questions to talk about around our table. 
For the next few minutes, I want you to engage with people around you, these three questions that you see on the screens around you. Where do you see abundance in your church or the ministry that you're involved in? And how are you releasing that abundance? Can you think of people in your church or ministry who may like to serve but need help in getting plugged in? How might you help them? Is your church stuck in a comfort zone? What comfort zones need to be addressed? In other words, do we need a little TNT once in a while to, to get us up off our... Yeah. Enter into conversation. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a few minutes. For that.